Are we good to go? Yep, good to go. All right. Hey, everybody, welcome Jim Butcher. Um, uh, the cool things about uh, uh, doing what I do. I'm Jeff Gomez. I'm the CEO of Starlight Winter Entertainment, and I get to visit these uh, uh, fantastic story worlds and their visionaries for a living. And this time, I'm doing it in front of all of you. Um, uh, Jim Butcher, as you know, let's hear it for the Dresden Files. <laughs> With regard to the Dresden Files, um, uh, there are fans even at Starlight Runner uh, of the Dresden Files, and they have uh, uh, sent me some of the geekiest questions you could imagine. <laughs> I'm going to supplement uh, your questions today. Uh, the Codex Alera, anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Not the second one out of the park. And uh, the new steampunk series, The Cinder Spires. Yeah. Which is perhaps most uh, relevant um, is that last night, uh, Jim commanded the Starship Valkyrie uh, to uh, uh, semi victory. <laughs> 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 Um, so, so Jim, before I, I, I open the floor, let, let's talk a little bit about that experience. I understand okay. you're uh, an experienced LARPer, and uh, that, um, uh, but, but last night, uh, to me, it's always something special at, at WeirdCon. You have uh, an incredibly um, uh, devoted crew that, uh, that worked real hard uh, last night. Tell us about the experience of kind of walking in on a brand new set of people and, and taking command of what you did? Uh, uh, well, they gave me a bullhorn, so... You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, when, when you're the only one in the room with a, you know, with the megaphone, then uh, uh, you're, you're, you're all right, you know, as far as that goes. Um, it was fun because I'd never played the game before, I'd never worked with the gate system before, I didn't know the rules or how anything worked. It's like, good, make him the captain. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Uh, and and uh, so the first, my first order was was for everyone to use their own initiative, and uh, not to wait for me to tell them to do something they needed doing. You know, so uh, you know, the, the standing order is, is that it was it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> and, uh, but I was kind of one of those laid back captains uh, in, 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 in some ways. Uh, uh, so now, did you did you uh, uh, latch on to that persona? Um, uh, Previously, while you were preparing uh, for this, or did it just kind of jump into you when you? Oh, mostly I just wanted to do the accent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I spent the entire evening you know, speaking that way. Uh, but that, that was a lot of fun, and uh, uh, we we had a really good time. I, I felt sorry for the science section. <laughs> science section was just like, I need you to do this and this and this and this. Why isn't it done? You know, like that is sort of the, right. the attitude I had. In the first half hour, they were jammed with yeah, the, Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and then everybody was getting sick and passing out, including myself. And so, you know, we kind of had a, red, a, red, a, a regular shuttle back to medical. Uh, uh, launch fighters, the pilot passed out. Awesome! Launch fighters <laughs> anyway. Exactly. Um, tell us about this, this uh, costume, this coat. Oh, uh, uh, I had picked up a, a, a really, really nice uh, steampunk airship captain coat. Uh, so it was this big black leather uh, uh, yeah, coat uh, that was de that was designed after uh, uh, 18th century uh, navy wear. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, and then I had just by pure it was destiny, it was fate because in the dealer's room, uh, uh, one of the dealers had two peaked caps, which I'd been looking for, and one of them was a matching black leather peaked cap go. to go with it. It was, it was a little Gestapo, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully it was just imposing, you know. Uh, but anyway, so I got to wear the hat, which I, I finally figured out why they wear those, where they wore those hats. They make you like six inches taller, uh, so you know that was a good thing. The um, uh, the, the movement into uh, uh, role playing games. Um, how do you draw that as a parallel to your uh, writing career? Did it actually predate it? Did they happen at oh, the same time? Yes, I, st I started playing D&D &D, 
uh, in first grade when my, wow. my when my parents were were convinced that was when I got the first the, the red the red, red and blue rule books, you know, the old <laughs> books. That was when my parents were had 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 gotten all their D and D information from those Jack Chick pamphlets. I don't know if any of you are familiar with those, but those over the top things. So I had to play I had to play D and D like on the sly. You know, I had to I had to I had to, I had to make up ways to go be able to go play D and D. Uh, and yeah, I, I, the, my first character was an elf. When that was what you played was an elf, and that was both race and class. Uh -huh. And an elf named Spock, because that was how. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty much how nerdy I was. So. That's amazing. And, and um, the uh, so, did your sensibility about uh, fantasy and, and world design and things like that emerge from the, the gaming, or, or was there a kind of parallel? Book reading. Uh, oh, to a degree from gaming, but I just I read every fantasy book that I could get when I was a kid. I mean, when I was in first grade, you know how they they would they would give you stars for every book that you read, yep. you know, like in first grade, you're in first grade reading program, and you know by the time by the time I'd gotten like 350 stars, they they they, they finally just said, okay, we've got to stop, <laughs> we've got to stop <laughs> giving you we're stars. <laughs> don't feel bad, but we know we have to we have you know uh, because you're, you're making other kids feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> when, I was in, when I was in fourth grade, uh, um, actually, my my teacher because the lessons were kind of boring, um, and you know I would I would get whatever it was that we were doing for the day down, and then I would read. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fourth grade, I, I had a teacher who thought that was what was not acceptable, so she started taking books away. And uh, by a month into 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 classes, because uh, uh, she said you're not going to get them back till the end of the year, yeah. and that was how she that was how she worked. So by a month into classes, she had to go get. A, a, a bookshelf from home, <laughs> and, and, and hand truck it into her office so that there was enough room for all the books she was taking away from me. And when she finally returned them at the end of the year, my mom had to drive to school and with a hand truck, and we had to, and a bunch of boxes, and we had to box them up and roll them out like that uh, because I would not stop reading. And, and you was, weren't very good at hanging your books. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, I would put my head down like I was asleep and do that, but she'd still catch me, you know, every couple of days, you know, or, or I would, or I would, I would slip because, you know, I just didn't care. Um, um, I was going to read books. I was bored out of my mind with, with just math. Uh, uh, so, yeah, that was kind of, and that was kind of where where I developed was from that and from and from, uh, uh, you know, watching movies. Um, I had a couple of sisters who were very supportive in buying me, uh, uh, in buying me science fiction and fantasy books. In making sure I got to go see the science fiction fantasy movies, just because you have your hand. <laughs> does not mean that you aren't there. <laughs> it's fun, I'm right. saying that out of character. Okay? <laughs> That was one of my favorite bits. Was in one of the, the, the one of the Dresden Files short stories. Was the, actually took place at a LARP, <laughs> and Harry starts making fun of all the, the various LARP conventions. And, uh, uh, you know, because you know, you know, Harry's looking at him like nerds. You know, like, 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 like Dresden, okay. The um, um, the the uh, the interpersonal connections you've got out of role play and, and LARP and the. Um, um, uh, versus kind of brick and mortar or real world uh, uh, relationships and connections. How would you compare the two as you reached uh, puberty, adolescence? And oh, so um, my friends were the were the people that I played D and D with, mm -hmm. and I mean that that was pretty much it. I mean, there were there were a few uh, there were a few choir and theater nerds who mm -hmm. wouldn't stoop to D and D. <laughs> um, but then uh, uh, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't start LARPing until I got to college, which I think is where most people start running into it, and, unless you were, you know, unfortunate enough to have parents or something who, who took you. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying that my kid had his first character before his first birthday, but uh, <laughs> I'm just saying he did get a suit of chainmail and a plus one ring of protection while he was there. So, uh, he was the cutest little first level fighter ever. Um, but uh, uh, when I went to college, that was when I, I, there were all these people out there fighting with Nerf swords, and I'm like, fighting with Nerf swords? That's awesome! I, I, need, I must do this! And uh, so I started LARPing, and, and my, my close friends through college and people who are still close friends of mine are the ones I started LARPing with uh, uh, in 1990. Uh, and continued that, and then I got out of it for a while because we moved off to Pennsylvania, and there were, there were no LARPs in, you know, in the immediate area. And, uh, uh, and then when my son turned 14, 
uh, uh, we had moved back to, to Independence, Missouri, and, and he was like, "Dad, do you think I could I could LARP?" Because he had kind of been raised on stories, mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, I I had brought him up right. I taught him started. I, we started playing Warhammer roleplay when he was about eight. You know? <laughs> but uh, 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 other dads, you know, they would give their kid their kids the key to the car and let them back it down the driveway. Me, let's roll up your first Warhammer character. <laughs> <laughs> poor child. But uh, uh, he said, you know, can we can we go LARP? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, okay, if we're gonna go LARP, I'm gonna have to teach you how to fight. And he's like, oh. Okay. <laughs> so we, we made a whole thing of it. We went shopping online. We found some good, some good swords, and you know we bought a set of matching swords. And, and uh, I started teaching how to fence. And we spent about half hour every day after school learning how to fence until I, I felt he was good enough that he would do all right. And, uh, and we found a local LARP, and we went out to our first LARP, and, and they're like, well. He is kind of at the bottom age of, of what we normally allow uh, in the combat game in the Nero chapter, and uh, and uh, you know we just need to put him up against our weapons marshal and make sure that he can handle himself, and uh, uh, you know he can you know, he can do this safely. And we're like, yeah, sure, uh, go ahead, go. And uh, you know the kid was about fourteen, kind of a skinny little guy, and, and he got out there and he whipped the weapons marshal ten to one. Oh. <laughs> He's running back over to me like this, and I'm like, he's like, did you see that? Did you see that? I fought him and I beat him. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, you did, son. And I'm like, I, I, I told you, I, I told you I was going to teach you. I told you that I, I, I knew how to do this. He said, yeah, but I, I figured you didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of kind of starting there and, and especially you know over the next couple of years as, as he grew tall taller and got that reach and turned into one of those one of those freaking kids at the LARP that runs around with two swords and can reach you from farther than you can reach and can run faster than you can run and he was that kid and, and I got to stand behind him and go go <laughs> and, uh, 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 and, and, and we had a great time and uh, you know, he kind of that was, that was my offspring. So, you know, uh, hopefully at some point in the future, you know, I'll be I'll be able to play the, the the wizard who doesn't have to run too much, and then he can be the old tactical fighter advising, you know, the third generation uh, of, of his child, who I really hope is a girl and learns to kick someone's ass with swords, because that would be. Yeah. Awesome. I've got a niece who's like a total nerd, but I can't convince her to get into sword fighting. I'm like, no, totally. You, you come with me, you train, you train for a couple of weeks, and then you show up and just whip everyone. It'll happen. I can make it happen. I don't want to do that. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, uh, briefly, because I, I'm sure some of the people out there know this, uh, this story, but where did Harry come from? Uh, Harry Dresden uh, was a character that I, I created um, uh, in a writing course in college. Uh, it was for a course called Writing a Genre Fiction Novel. Uh, uh, and the course was, uh, and the, 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 the homework and the test was, and the final was, you wrote a genre fiction novel. And you had X number of months to finish it, and if you didn't finish it, you didn't pass. Wow. And that was how it worked. Uh, uh, and so. Uh, I, had, I had actually taken this course twice already and had written two novels that were just awful. And, um, uh, and I, I'd had several more novels that I'd written on my own which were at least equally terrible. Um, but I had been um, trying for a long time to convince this professor how wrong she was um, on account of I had a bachelor's degree in English literature <laughs> with an emphasis in creative writing, whereas she had merely published 40 novels. <laughs> you know, when you're, when, when you're about 25 and you're a guy, you really, it's, it's hard to tell you anything. So uh, at least that was my experience of being 25. Um, and uh, finally, one semester, I decided to teach her uh, by just doing everything that she said. And I was going to be her good little writing monkey for the semester, and I was going to fill out all her little worksheets and do all her little outlines and, and use her, her character creation guidelines, and I was going to show her what awful cookie-cutter pablum crap resulted from such a process. So I wrote the first book of the Dresden Files. <laughs> And Harry Dresden was someone that I put together with this very, uh, this very, uh, uh, very rigid sort of structural process, uh, where I said, "Okay, I'm going to take a character, and I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take wizards and detectives, and I'm going to take all the things that I like from wizard characters that I've liked and detective characters from my that I've liked, and I'm going to pull them, put them all in this one guy, and I'm going to make him 
uh, uh, you know, so uh, so I, I, I started grabbing. It's like, okay, give me give me a bit of Gandalf, give me some Merlin, uh, give me some Belgarath, and then over here. Uh, I'm going to take some Sherlock, and I'm going to take some Spencer, and I'm going to take uh, uh, I'm going to take some Travis McGee, and I'm going to put them all on this character, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, started working out, you know, how am I going to build this guy? And what I eventually realized was that Wizards and Private Eyes essentially serve, serve the same role in this story. Uh, they're the characters who go places where no one else will go and find out things no one else will find out. Mm -hmm. And what makes them dangerous is not the cool things that they do or the gun they carry in their coat. What makes them dangerous is the fact that they're willing to go nosing around and find out things that nobody else knows. What made Gandalf a threat was not his cool special effects against the Balrog or even against the Ring Race. What made him a threat was he was the guy who went and did all the digging and the research and found out that, oh my gosh, there's the one ring. Uh, 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 that's what made him dangerous, and uh, uh, so, th and that was kind of that was a realization that I just sort of took in stride a at the time and didn't realize that I I hit on something important uh, uh, because you know I was busy proving my teacher how wrong she was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I remember after I wrote, I turned in the first two chapters uh, because it was one of, it was a, it was a course that you went in every week and it was a, it was a consultation course and I turned in the first two chapters and and she she was a, she was a, a critic who would read a chapter and roll it up and lean over the desk and, and thwack you on the top of the head with it and say, what were you thinking? And then kind of outline what was awful about that chapter. And that was sort of, that was sort of de rigueur for, 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 her, for her course. And she got done reading it. She looked up at me and, and tossed the chapter back down and said, well, you did it. And I said, what? She said, because I was used to getting torn apart. She was, she was tough. I mean, she, was, she, was, uh, she gave you professional level criticism. She said, you did it. This will sell. She says, I don't know if this will be the first thing that you sell, but it will sell. It's of sufficient quality that you'll make it work. Wow. And, and I was like, look, 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 look. <laughs> what? And yeah, you, you totally will. And, and, and uh, so after that, uh, I started being a little bit less impressed with how smart I was. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, just got to work on telling the story. I remember coming in the next week and said, well, I've kind of got this plan for it where... Uh, uh, you know, this will be the first book, but I, I think I want to do a series that's about 20 books long, and with a big old trilogy at the end of it to kind of capstone the thing off. You back, back then, yeah, back then you, you yeah, that was in mind. chapter two. Wow. And and, <laughs> and I said, and I said, do you think that would be all right? <laughs> and she sort of looked at me because she knew darn well that I was never going to sell a 20 book series to anybody like that. And she, and, and, but she did not want to, she had finally gotten me to start listening to her, so she did not want to encourage me. And so she gave me the look that I seemed to recognize as her, oh, Roadrunner, or, or, or oh, Wiley, go right over that cliff, there's nothing I can do. <laughs> and she sort of looked at me and said, yeah, I think if you can, if you can sell that, you should be doing all right. <laughs> you know, so, uh, uh, and because I did not know that it was impossible, uh, uh, I went. I, I, I never looked down. <laughs> wow. Apparently, if you don't look down, you just keep running. Important <laughs> <laughs> point. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, there, there are some aspiring writers. I would take it out there. Um, uh, how did you make the sale? Um, making the sale was okay. Uh, I got a letter of introduction from my teacher uh, to her editor, and she published uh, several books at Ace. And so her editor was Ginger Buchanan, and I got a letter of introduction and recommendation for this manuscript. So Ginger Buchanan said, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give it a look. And she had it for two and a half years <laughs> uh, uh, without having time to look at it. Uh, uh, because, uh, I mean, just the, the sheer number of, uh, of uh, uh, submissions that editors get is staggering. And the fact is, is that she kept it for two and a half years. And that was uh, very encouraging, unless you, you were the guy waiting that long. <laughs> and uh, uh, so during this time, uh, uh, I, I, I talked with several other people, uh, uh, and, and a friend of mine suggested, you know, what you really need to do at this point, if you've got the skills that you need, the next thing you need to do is you need to start making contacts in the business. You need to network. Which, I mean, this was, uh, you know, this was the, the 90s. Networking wasn't as big a thing then. Uh, uh, it wasn't. We, folks weren't quite as aware of it because we, 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 the social networks were just now coming online. You know, Google was just now coming <laughs> online. Um, and uh, so I said, that, well, okay. Uh, well, what do you think I should do? She's like, well, there's no, there's, there's no substitute for going and actually meeting people. Go meet them face to face. Go talk to them. And uh, so I started going to conventions and going up to editors and and agents and introducing myself and uh, uh, talking and and I literally snuck into a coffee clash that was full past Klingon security. Uh, uh, I, I actually arranged for there to be a distraction so I could sneak into the room while <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And and then there was this, and, and I remember I because I was sitting there and I was on time and somebody rolled in a couple of minutes late and so oh, I'm so sorry I'm late. And came to the table and looked at the table and all the chairs were full and it was a, it was me with a couple of editors and this 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 horrible this this, this horrified oh look on his face as, as he saw all the chairs were full. And I looked around. I'm like, "Well, we can pull up another chair, right? I mean, I mean, he's here." And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, we can pull up another chair." Sometimes he didn't steal completely. No, I said, "Okay, okay." So we got another chair and just shoved around. Uh, uh, but I started meeting people, and finally, a uh, 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 notion occurred to me. That's like, well, maybe what I should do is I should be focusing on the editors and agents who, you know actually publish things that are kind of like I want to publish yeah, and actually know. represent people who write things like I want to write. And so I said, well, well, who is there? And at the time, you know, Urban Fantasy was basically Laurel Hamilton. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she was pretty much it. And uh, so I said, okay, well, let me find out where Laurel Hamilton's agent is. And, uh, uh, and so and Laurel was actually going to be at a convention. And uh, so I arranged to, to go to the convention, and I was on I was on a, mail, a mailing fan list, and, and so I collected a bunch of questions from the folks on the list, and uh, and went up to Laurel and said, hey, can I have twenty minutes of your time at some point during the convention? And I got, I got some some folks from your fan mailing list with some questions, and I would love to just be able to share them. And Laurel's like, yeah, sure. And uh, all these people were talking to Laurel, and, and you know, it was, it was a writing convention, so all, there were a bunch of aspiring writers there like me, and they were all talking to Laurel about about. Uh, 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 you know Anita and Jean Luc and Richard and so on, and uh, you know I, I was I, I could see this kind of this kind of desperate glaze coming over her eyes <laughs> as she was there, and because and, and, uh, uh, it was just nonstop. And so at one point I, I looked at Laurel and I was like, "Do you like Buffy?" <laughs> and she's like, "I love Buffy." <laughs> Babylon Five. I, I, I really, I felt like Gerald Ford on The Simpsons. You know? uh, do you like Babylon Five? I love Babylon Five. So we talked Babylon Five and Buffy for like an hour. And uh, and the next day, uh, I was kind of wandering around at the at the at the at the convention, just sort of bumping into walls, which is what I normally do. And uh, uh, Laurel spots me and says, "Hey, Jim, do you want to go to lunch?" And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." <laughs> I <want to> lunch. <laughs> And so I wound up at lunch with with Laurel Hamilton and three other authors and three agents and two editors and 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 they all like Buffy and Babylon Five. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but because they were all you know they were all fellow nerds and uh, uh, so by the end of the convention, uh, every agent who was there who, who, who that I had met who included Laurel's agent and a couple other ones including my current agent. Uh, uh, had offered to represent me, uh, and, and, and I'm like, awesome. I'm like, but you, you were, you, and, and, and I actually, I was sitting and talking to Jennifer Jackson, who's currently my agent, and, and and she, I looked at her, and she's, I'm like, you, you want to represent me now? She's, she's like, yeah, and I'm like, but you rejected me. She says, I know. I said two weeks ago. <laughs> she says, I know, but that was before I knew you played the Amber Diceless role playing game. <laughs> And, uh, uh, and and so you know, and, and that was that was basically that was how it went. I, I can understand innate talent. Where did the balls come from? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, uh, you, you you try something long enough. I think I think I blame most of it on Harry Dresden. Um, <laughs> on the way to that conference, uh, uh, on the way to the airport to go to that conference. Uh, I blew out a tire on the way to the airport. And this was it was a red eye flight. And it was three. It was literally it was three thirty in the morning, and I was halfway there. And I was five miles. This was on the the road between uh, Norman, Oklahoma, and the Oklahoma City Airport. And I was literally five miles from the nearest home. Uh, and I, I I was right at the side of the highway. It was it was freezing cold. There was sleet coming down, and uh, uh, the tire had blown out on my on my Firebird. And I was trying to get uh, on these old Firebirds. There was there was one nut that was a special lock nut that was supposed to keep people from stealing your tires, as though stealing <laughs> tires off your Pontiac Firebird was a big deal. <laughs> um, but the damn lock nut, it, you, you could not get the thing off, and and it, it had frozen on. And I, I tried it. I was on it for like half an hour. I had grease all over oh myself. My I, had, I had taken the skin off my knuckles. And and you know I, I couldn't feel my fingers anymore, and there were semis going by like like three feet away, you, you know, uh, behind me as I was trying to change this tire, and I finally just sat down and was like, what am I going to do? Uh, okay, 
if I if I run, I can get to a phone in, in you know I can get to a phone in, in maybe an hour or, or you know forty five minutes or an hour. Uh, uh, if uh, if I call Shannon, then she can be here to pick me up and get me to the airport. You know, but Jay was Jay was still pretty little. So, you know, she's going to have to bring him along. It's going to take her a lot of time. There's no way I'm going to make this plane. I'm done. This is not going to happen. And and I was I was just sitting there in my car and uh, doing the math and coming up zeros. And, and 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 I thought to myself, you know what? If you had a character in a book who was acting like this, you would drop an anvil on him immediately. <laughs> the, the character who was feeling sorry for himself. You know, Harry Dresden would not stop at this point. Get your ass back out into the sleet and get that tire changed. And so I did, and I, I screamed at it, and I cursed, and I was yelling the, the foulest language I could, and I finally got the damn the damn lock nut off the car, and got the tire changed, and made it to my plane, it, 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 literally so close, so close that I did not have time to go to the bathroom and wipe off the grease uh, 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 off my hands, and uh, uh, which you know. Security wasn't quite as tight in those days. <laughs> Otherwise, I think there would have been an issue. But uh, yeah, if I hadn't done that, uh, uh, so after that, after that happened, at that point, it's like I said, that that was it was after that that I started going. You know what? Maybe I just need to start pushing a little harder. And uh, uh, so that's sort of what I did. Force yeah. of will, unstoppability. Uh, it really at, at times makes the the difference. All the difference in the world. That's, right. that's fantastic. Breaking into the writing business is all about is all about tiebreakers. It's all about finding the thing that, that that gets you that much closer. You know, not the thing that gets you this much closer, but that much closer. And yeah. you keep stacking those up until you, until you break through. Fantastic. And um, and he didn't have to be a dick about it. He got the guy a chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that, that's it, it. Never it never it never pays off to be a jerk. It's it's not it's not it's not right and it's not smart. So don't do it. Excellent, excellent. Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, start the, um, the the formal uh, QA with with the audience. Um, I'm going to throw in uh, a, an initial question to start things off, just to get to that level of nerdiness that we're looking for here. <laughs> um, uh, so this, this these are the kinds of questions that come out of Starlight Runner when we uh, 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 start working with. Uh, uh, franchise visionaries and things like that. Um, the basis for magic in the uh, uh, Dresden world, in general, it's said that um, uh, in the books that magic is based on using a person's life force um, with uh, with two methods. The first is thaumaturgy, um, which focuses on making connections between objects over a longer range uh, with greater precision. And the second is evocation, uh, which is allowed flashy and often involves uh, damage and, and things like that. Yes, that's special effects budget there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this can be clearly used in explaining Harry's magic. Um, but what's the basis for uh, uh, fairies, angels, and all this other uh, magical and supernatural uh, uh, content? All the various creatures in the Dresden Files interact with the same kind of magical energy in slightly different ways. So wizards have their own, you know, human wizards have their own their own means of, of interacting with magic, and one of the side effects that human wizards get, uh, um, people are sort of conflicted a little bit, maybe you've noticed. Um, <laughs> Uh, 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 you know, like you want to go to the gym, but you know, really, there's this conflict in that something really good is on TV, and plus, <laughs> it hurts. Uh, you know, so uh, uh, and, and that sort of that that sort of drive, that sort of uh, um, of, of of will versus your natural instinct, uh, exists everywhere in humanity. And as a result, there's it, that kind of creates a, a, a magical turbulence around wizards that results in these weird effects that happen around. Them. So the the exact effects kind of change over time. So so 300 years before, wizards were were, were making milk go sour and and, and mm -hmm. having bad skin. <laughs> uh, uh, but now wizards are, are are frying technology and blowing out people's smartphones. Um, uh, uh, which you know I've got, I've got a smartphone now and I I, I worry about it. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, and and everything re everything in in the Dresden Files universe kind of has its own unique interaction with magic. Uh, so when you get to the fairies, they have their own unique interaction, with, you know. But they can go play video games at least, because one of the things they're not is conflicted. You know, <laughs> a fairy will. I mean, if a fairy wants to kill you, they will be cheerful about it. There's no, there's no hesitation about it. Uh, uh, so, so everybody has a slightly different spin on the same thing. Interesting. Is there an, an overall 
design sensibility that's rooted in any existing magical system? Um, yeah, I kind of I, I, I went and grabbed. A, a, I went actually. I went to I went to Borders at the time. I went to their metaphysics section and grabbed several different books on, on various uh, folks who incorporate magic into their religion, and uh, uh, and started reading through and, and taking all the bits that I liked and and trying to have something that that held together and made sense uh, uh, on its own because I didn't want magic to be this sort of semi sentient thing that went off and did things by itself. Where magic, do what you will. I, I never liked that. Uh, 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 I wanted it to be. Uh, I wanted this, the, the, the story to be about people's choices and about the consequences of those choices. And so that you know, magic had to, had to be a reflection of that. So one of the, the great things about magic in the Dresden Files is you can't do anything with it that you don't truly believe in. Uh, uh, otherwise, it just doesn't work. Right. Uh, uh, so, you know who, so you know who a wizard is by what he does with his magic. There you go. Excellent. Um, let's, uh, let's open it up, guys. Um, yeah, all the way to the Two really fast ones. First, a modern movie theater, a modern television set, and a modern stereo are basically computers. So does Harry's experience of media that he keeps making, you know, popped quotations, does it end with the vinyl era? <laughs> no, because uh, uh, he goes to the drive-in uh, to go to movies, where he can just kind of sit. There's a drive-in someplace? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, go, go to the Midwest and they're all over. Um, and when you go to the drive-in, you can just sit down on the hood of your car and the, 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 there's, there's hundreds of speakers around you and the movie's just ambient. So even if you blow out the speakers that are near you, you're okay. Second question do we, from my wife, do we ever get to Hawaii story? Uh, we might, because I've got to, I've got to do enough stories to, to, to make another short story anthology so that I can get all the short stories in. Uh, uh, because there were a couple, there were a couple stories didn't make it into the original anthology, and I was really upset about that, about the timing on that. So, but the only way I could fix it was to write enough short stories for a second anthology. So, we're doing more short stories. I, I hate short stories. Oh my gosh, you've got to do everything you do in a novel, except you've got to do it in this much space. It's like trying to have a knife fight in a phone booth. <laughs> More That's Harry's father, by the way. Uh, more Harry's father? Yes, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. I, uh, the questions I have are uh, oh, about uh, Ebenezer. Okay. Um, real, real quickly, how old is he? Does he still have a Scottish accent? In the, and is the Blackstaff an entity sort of like a warrior variant of Bob the Skull? Uh, okay. In order, Ebenezer is uh, slightly over 300. Okay. Um, uh, uh, he's been around. He's been, he's been around a good long while. His Scottish accent only really comes out when he's angry, uh, uh, because uh, he still has kept in communication with people, and, and so his you know his speech patterns has, have have changed slowly over the centuries. Uh, the black staff is not sentient per se. Uh, it, it's just really, really, really powerful and, and tapped into like some serious elemental powers of the universe. Uh, uh, but basically all, basically, all it really is is insulation from using those powers, so. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All the way back, Jeff. So you said that you had much of the, the Dresden Files plans for 20 books from the beginning. Yeah, yeah 20. OK. Um, based on the success that we've seen with Netflix's House of Cards and Orange is the New Black, do you think there's a similar model of dropping a whole number of books at the same time? Do you think that could work in publishing three books? Wow. You mean of, 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 of dropping a whole bunch of books out at once? Right. No, because the fan base would strangle me if I stopped long enough, stopped publishing long enough to have several books at once. <laughs> <laughs> Let me stop writing for five years, fans. You'll like it at the end of the time, really. <laughs> I'm kidding. There would be torches and pitchforks outside my house. Uh, I, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, and, you know, so. And there you go. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about death curses. I was wondering if this. When it's described in the book, it seems almost like just a gathering and releasing of energy. I was wondering if they could theoretically be used to give a blessing to really help someone out. To really, they really could. Uh, uh, they really could, especially if it was done with forethought and and you were basically doing this and, and planning to die as a result of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, is that dying is something that people really don't want to do, uh, uh, for the most part. Um, uh, so it's a little bit difficult to make that happen with with it's a little bit difficult to believe in that mm -hmm. uh, Unless you really need to it is possible although it's, it's something that would be under extraordinary circumstances with an extraordinary person uh, 
Um, it's way easier to blow stuff up with that. <laughs> Good deal. Yeah. Um, two questions. I'm kind of watching the uh, progression of Harry and the power levels he's dealing with. I mean, uh, in the last novel, I'm seeing, you know, Odin as the Wild Hunt, as the... So we're talking some really powerful archetypes. Yeah, we get to do the fun stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> and then as, uh, as a writer, a storyteller myself, I'm looking at it going, uh, you've killed him now, brought him back, sort of. And, you know, in a detective novel, you can only, you know, beat a guy up so much. I mean, there's nothing left of Harry that hasn't been damaged at this point. Yeah. Do you have a... <laughs> Is there a power art other than killing off his loved ones that, that gives him some sort of, you know, it, it almost seems like there's a peak here that we're going to yeah, run into. Be, yeah. Well, yeah, and we're closing out on the end of the series, too. Uh, I mean, you know, we're, we're I'm, I'm working on book 15 here of, of, of you know, 23, so... Uh, uh, we're, we're closing out on the end of the case books and getting ready to do the big-time stuff in, in, the, in, the, in the, the trilogy at the end. So... Uh, as far as as far as the power art goes, though, um, kind of my rule of thumb. Have, have you guys read uh, 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 Old Man's War yes. uh, by Scalzi? Uh, in, in it, you know, the basic premise is that you've got these really these super soldiers get these genetically enhanced bodies that are really awesome, and they get these weapons that are just incredible nanotechnology based weapons, and they get all this really cool stuff, and then they get this lecture that says, "Remember." You're a soldier. Soldiers don't go to war with everything they want. They go to war with the bare minimum that they need to survive. It's a tough universe out there. This is the bare minimum you need to survive. You know, it's all this, all this super-powered stuff. And uh, Dresden is getting, getting exactly the same thing. Uh, uh, I know that people will come up and say, well, he's got all these superpowers and stuff now. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll just see how much good those do. <laughs> um, from from Starlight, we've noticed that you've um, uh, progressed across many of the ancient uh, mythologies and um, and are now uh, dabbling with um, uh, religions, uh, some of which are contemporary, like Christianity. Um, uh, uh, talk to us about um, the uh, the cosmological aspect of, of the universe. Um, are, are we really heading toward some kind of true uh, a, a biblical uh, a situation? Um, uh, are you going to be dealing uh, uh, more deeply with um, uh, Judeo-Christian and other contemporary uh, uh, belief systems? And, and how does that work? How are they all intersecting with one another? Um. <clears throat> We will we'll get into how they intersect in the books a little bit more. Oh, okay. uh, part of it is stuff that I'm not I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, we we are gonna we are gonna get involved. You, you are gonna get to, get to see a little bit more of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, although, uh, you know, and it's not my purpose to, to kind of lay out anything uh, in terms of, of 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 whose religion is cool. Uh -huh. um, uh, we. I, I mostly I mostly hit the Judeo Christian stuff because uh, I was I was raised on the on the kind of on the mental end of the fundamental scale. Mm. Um, <laughs> so I mean, uh, 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 as opposed to on the fun end of the fundamental, scale, <laughs> which I sort of got into later as a teenager. But but you know I was one of those kids who like memorized entire books of the of the Bible. Mm. You know, uh, so you know when it comes to biblical stuff. I, I feel like I'm, I'm fairly well grounded, so I haven't hit a lot, on a lot of other people's religions because it's a little bit more difficult for me to, to, to get into that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I can do Wiccan a little bit more because I got some close friends who are, and I will go and, and, and I'll, I'll go talk religion with them, and, and I feel a little bit more comfortable doing that. But uh, 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 so far, it's it, I don't want to start writing about what I know nothing about, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I know that Hinduism is one of those is one of those belief systems that's so complex. You know, Hindus kind of wonder what's going on occasionally because they 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 they, they, they seriously they got they've got so many stories and they've got they've got so many, they've got so much lore behind their you know behind their beliefs. Um, but uh, uh, we'll get into a little bit more. I mean, I I haven't got the devil on stage yet. Uh, I, I do. You guys, do you guys all know the the, the title of the last three books of the series? 
Oh, okay. You guys don't know that. Hell's uh, bells, empty nights, and stars and stones. Stars and stones, and hell's bells, and empty night. Yeah. There's a reason that those Very are the, good. those are the curse words in the in the, in the wizarding world. Uh, and uh, so that's the title of the, the final series, the, the final books of the series. That's great. You know, they all have the same number of letters too, so it's all kind of <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was wondering, with the Sci-Fi Channel series, how much input, if any, did you have on that, and were you, and did you enjoy the final result of it? We know that uh, anytime you jump media, right, pain is involved, deep, deep pain. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk to us about that, that process and, and how you... Um, I had zero stuff. contractual authority over anything to do with that. None. Absolutely none. However... Uh, uh, Robert Wolf, who was the producer uh, and was initially was in charge of the project, um, I got I got I had, I had enjoyed I had enjoyed the hell out of, of the stuff he did on, on Deep Space Nine. I enjoyed I enjoyed the hell out of out of the early uh, portion of Andromeda where he was working on Andromeda, uh, season one and part of season two is, is, is the work he had done, and I had loved that. And uh, uh, some some folks who were on the on the beta list. Had, or, 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 or excuse me, who were on the Jim Butcher website had were also on 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 his website, and, and they had come to me and said, "Hey, Robert's talking about this thing. I think that may, maybe he might be working on what you're doing." And so I went and started gathering information, and then approached approached him and said, "Are you the guy who's who's in charge of this uh, with sci-fi now?" Because he could only talk about it in indirect terms, and he was like, "Wow, you you you're kind of a detective. You found this out." <laughs> and I'm like, "Yes, it was all me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all by myself." <laughs> and uh, uh, we started, and, and so we started talking, and and it turns out that that he likes Buffy in Babylon Five. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was a nerd as well, and we got along real well. And the guy was, uh, and he's smart, and uh, he did he he he'd read the books and really liked them. And so he was like, "Listen, I want to do something that that is as close as I can get to the books." And I'm like, "Okay, let's let's talk about it." And so I was working with him. I don't know if you guys. Uh, uh, they only showed it once, the original pilot episode of Stormfront, and they showed it at like 3 o'clock in the morning on the Sci-Fi Channel. Uh, uh, but it was actually, if you saw that, it was a much closer, it was something that was much closer to the books than the, than the series wound up being. Um, as far as the series itself going over, I understand the changes that got made and, and why they had to get made. Um, the, uh, understand that until about two weeks before they started shooting. The plan for the series was for it to be a serialized story arc. Um, season one was going to intertwine the plots of Stormfront and Full Moon, and that was the, that was the plan. Uh, and that's what they were writing towards. Um, and then two weeks beforehand, somebody at Sci-Fi put somebody other than Robert in charge, and it was a guy who one of the guys who had just come off of uh, uh, Charmed, and he said. Oh. <laughs> And he said, hey, we don't like, uh, people don't like serialized stuff, they like episodic stuff, so we're going to do episodes. And it's like, we've only got two weeks, we don't have time to, you know, to redo everything. He's like, yeah, just change all the, change all the names and, 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 and actors and we'll just disconnect everything. And uh, uh, so the series would have been much different, you know, when, when you understand, oh, these characters were all supposed to be connected and have these ongoing issues and problems. And, uh, 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 you know, it would have been, been a much different series. Uh, uh, unfortunately... It was not to be. That said, the series could have been worse. Uh, uh, they were working very hard on it. Uh, uh, I, I visited the set several times, and uh, uh, you know the crew was was very interested in doing a good job. Uh, the craft table was superb. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, seriously, you could have steak on the set every day. And, yeah, I, I actually went to Robert about that. I'm like, seriously, steak every day? He's he's, he's like, yeah, you got to feed your crew or they will kill you. <laughs> Feed your crew well. That's half your job right there. It's like, okay, all right. I'll, I'll remember that in case I ever need to. Fit. I should have remembered that as the captain last night. If I ordered pizza, I dare say things would have gone smooth. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was it like looking into Harry's eyes, uh, the incarnation of your creation? Uh, uh, sort of odd. <laughs> uh, when I was actually there on set, uh, I, I mean, I actually appear in one of the episodes. I'm one of Butters' minions in the background. Uh, uh, and uh, you actually, I've got my ponytail and my glasses on, you can see me. Um, but uh, uh, I, it, was, it was odd because, you know, there's, there's Harry and there's Murphy and there's Butters. So only, 
everybody else could see them too, you know, so <laughs> that was sort of new for me. I mean, basically my job is to write down my conversations between my imaginary friends. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was sort of strange, and, and there, there's, I don't know if you've ever, uh, if anybody's ever been on the set of a TV show, but there is a small army of people there. There was like, there's like a hundred people doing stuff. And, and, you know, and they'll come up to you, and, and all these folks were coming up to me, man, I love your books. You know, the folks that were, like, on the crew and working on it, they were very passionate about what they were doing. And uh, I really wish that uh, they had not gotten uh, quite so, I, I really wish it had not been for sci-fi, that they were working for the channel that just seems to hate science fiction so much. <laughs> but uh, uh, who knows, maybe we'll get another, another stab at it someday. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. So in Full Moon, I notice that uh, Harry has the silver bear belt buckle that he uses after like the car accident and kind of gives him that boost. Um, that isn't in Full Moon. That is in Blood Rites. Oh, excuse me. Blood Rites. <laughs> oh, I feel awesome. I totally still at that. <laughs> this, is, this, is, uh, this is Priscilla, who's the mistress of continuity of the beta list. So, and, uh, so you know, she, she'll whip out a quote. Here, you missed it. <laughs> so, um, but he, he has that during that car crash scene. And then it never shows up again. And I'm right. curious, like, first off, why? And second off, how do you make a decision as to what is going to become kind of part of his permanent arsenal and what isn't? Um, okay, uh, it didn't show up again because the first time he'd used it, he'd nearly gotten himself killed right. uh, uh, and somebody else killed uh, as a result of it. Uh, and the, sec the second day, kind of because that one was a real pain to create, uh, uh, and how I decide what becomes part of his permanent arsenal is everything that he does, he's got to maintain. So basically, Harry spends about 20 hours a week just making sure that his stuff keeps working. Uh, 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 it's a little bit less than that if he, the, the lower down he goes. But for the most part, he's got a he's got a part time job where where you know he's at the wizard gym making sure that his stuff keeps going. Um, uh, uh, so he can only maintain so much. Uh, uh, and that's I've, I've kind of got a vague limit figured out of, of, of this is this is how much he can do at any one time. So the stuff that he maintains as part of his ar arsenal is stuff that's going to be useful in the majority of situations he's going to face. You know, he often needs to blow something up, blasting rod. He often needs something to help him out with a number of minor chores, staff. You know, uh, uh, not getting shot with bullets is great. Shield bracelet. Uh, uh, you know, those are those are stuff that he ma absolutely maintains. Uh, uh, you know, the force rings were something that were really handy because, you know, you never know when you might be going to the grocery store and bam, 30 ghouls. <laughs> you know, maybe they were there, obviously, rounding up the, the meat that they were throwing out of the butcher. And, uh, you know, because Dresden was there, they noticed. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, his stuff is, it, he can't have just unlimited stuff. He's got to keep it up. So he only so basically, uh, uh, if he if he comes up with a new toy, it's something that I've got a, a purpose in mind for uh, for somewhere in the story. Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, Lauren, how are we doing on time? We've got uh, it's uh, almost. Uh, oh, oh, we're set. Oh, okay, so we got time for a couple of three more questions. Uh, okay, um, uh, I, I have to squeeze in the starlight questions. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, uh, until now, the general uh, worldview of, of what's been going on is, is kind of self-denial. Um, uh, magic doesn't exist and so forth, and yet the stakes are getting higher, the fireworks more uh, spectacular, um, and, uh, and we... we, 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 we <laughs> Uh, a, a vague awareness developing. The, the Special Investigations Unit at the, the Chicago Police Force um, and uh, uh, the, the Red Court incident has had worldwide uh, effects. Um, Marconi is his name? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marcone. Get, Marcone getting uh, uh, more deeply involved in the supernatural world. So where is the FBI, CIA, NSA, Interpol? What, when are they going to start poking around? Um, they already have been. They've appeared in the series very quietly. Uh, uh, I'm not going to tell you where, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, there are things that have happened in the series that have no explanation uh, uh, that the spooks have done, and uh, uh -huh. the whole thing about when you're when you're dealing with the supernatural world and you've got no supernatural resources at all, you better be invisible, uh, <laughs> and they kind of have been. 
uh, uh, but we will see we will see more of them in the future as we as we get closer to to the big bang to the, you know the big explosions. Wow. Uh, 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 because you know, by the end of this, we're by the end of this, we're we're we're, we're going to be talking, you know, kaiju and Jaeger epic. So, serious. Yeah. Final couple of questions. Yeah. So, um, I talk about vampires for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, you had several different kinds of vampires. One less now. Um, <laughs> yeah, what well, made you? There were a couple that might have been out of range. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> you, you know. I that. Yeah. Okay. okay, but um, why why so many different kinds of vampires, and do these come from mythologies that you had to research? Um, when I was putting together uh, vampires for the Dresden Files, I decided that that the Hollywood vampire was not was going to be what I used, um, and but that the Hollywood vampire was based upon encounters with real vampires. And so basically, humanity's version of the view of the vampire was the blind man with the elephant. And they had, they had sort of encountered all these different things and sort of lumped them all together into this conglomeration vampire, and that's the vampire that was on TV. Uh, but basically, the kind of vampires you have are sexy vampires, uh, uh, you know, the kind of sexy, Byronic, romantic vampire. You've got the shambling corpse that comes up out of the grave and does horrible things to you vampire. Uh, uh, that doesn't have fangs or anything. It's mostly a zombie that does awful stuff. Uh, uh, and then you've got the blood drinking, the, you know, the blood drinking fiend vampire. And so I said, okay, we're going to have three vampire courts. Actually, you've got a couple other ones. Uh, uh, and there's 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 several breeds of minor vampire that just don't have a court that are running around out there, and they they tend to keep their heads down. Uh, uh, and then then of course you got the J court. Um, who I'm not going to tell you anything about. Um, <laughs> but so so, but there were these three major archetypes for vampires that I wanted to split the vampires into. Uh, uh, so that I broke them into the, the red court, the black court, and, and the white court. Uh, uh, and so you know, there, there's this this group of of, of 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 bone, blood, and rock vampires that are out there, uh, uh, and and that was where they came from. Um. Uh, we, we have essentially 20, a 23 book arc, and yet it seems to me that there is a, uh, a, a compressed amount of time. They're not taking place over many, many years, uh, it seems. Um, and, but, uh, but then we have uh, Maggie Angelica. Um, what's, um, what's the purpose of bringing in a, an infant child when things are going to end soon? Uh, well, she's, 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 she's what? She's... Uh She's nine now, uh -huh. uh, uh, and uh, uh, okay. Well, for one thing, I am not immune to commercial concerns, and there might always need to be a spinoff. Ah. For for another thing, um, children more than anything else you encounter in, in your lifetime will make you a different person. More than anything else in the world, when there is suddenly, when my son was born, they, they, they handed him over to me, and he looked up at me, and he was furious. <laughs> you could see it in his face. He was absolutely outraged at the kind of day he'd had. <laughs> and it was this shock, because there was this, there was this little tiny force of personality that I was holding. And I suddenly said to myself, oh my God, there's another person, I'm responsible for them. You know, I can't balance my checkbook, and I'm responsible for this other person, this, this, this whole person's life. And when that happens to you, the kid makes you somebody who is stronger and better and more patient and more loving and more kind and more wise than you could have been without that kid. Uh, the kid comes along and forces you to level up as a human being. <laughs> That's exactly what happens uh, uh, because you've got to do it because you've got the, and you will do things for that kid that you will never ever ever do just for yourself. And that there's going to be there's there's going to be there's going to be some play with that. That's great. Cool. That's beautiful, guys. Uh, in in the last few seconds, I want you to 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 think about some of the other books and stuff like that. I know Dresden, we all love them, but there are some fantastic universes elsewise, um, uh, right there in the corner. Um, yeah, I was meaning to ask: Are you ever going to return to the Alira world? 
Um, I don't have plans to go back there now. I've got a few ideas that I could go back and do. Uh, so, you know, it's entirely possible that I'll need to pay off gambling debts or something one day. <laughs> uh, in which case, in which case, I may, in which case, I may need to go back there. Um, uh, uh, but I, I don't have any plans to go back there right now. But I haven't written it off either. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. So one of the coolest moments I ever had in a fantasy novel uh, that I read, at least recently, was when uh, I when you were looking back into uh, Tabby's mother's past when he was born, and you know his aunt dies and says, "Hail Octavian!" Hail Octavian. And it was like a big deal for me. That was totally spoiler. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, like just reading that, I like squeed in my pants a little bit. <laughs> like, and I'm like, did you squeed when you were writing that? <laughs> Maybe. I, honestly, it's all kind of a blur when I'm done. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll sit down and start writing, and I'll, I'll be I'll be bitching and complaining uh, about how this is not working and how terrible this is, uh, kind of while I'm writing, uh, you know, because I'll be going along, and, and it's just like it is for me for anybody else. I, I'll be convinced. I just got done with a chapter uh, where I kind of had some major bad things happen in the Dresden Files universe, and uh, I got to the end of the chapter, and I was like, that's awful. But you know what? It's 7.30 in the morning, and I'm tired, and... Okay, you know what? I'll just save it, send it. I can rewrite it later if I have to. You know, we'll see what people have to say about it. Maybe it's not as terrible as I thought. And I got this huge, powerful response from the beta readers. Like, you know, that was, oh my god, what did you just do? Oh my god! Like that. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe it wasn't all that awful. <laughs> But there's a very different perception. You always have to understand that as a writer, you have a totally different point of view of what's going on than the reader does. Because you're the one who's on the stage, uh, and you can see behind all the you can see all behind all the curtains and, and the secret doors, and you know how a magic trick works. So you know maybe it doesn't look amazing to you, but it, it, the person who's viewing the magic trick from out in the audience has got a totally different point of view on it than you do. So it's one of those things you have to learn to, to you have to learn to be able to project yourself into the into the reader's uh, perspective. Uh, in, order, in order to, to know if this trick is working or not. Uh, how does one become a beta reader? <laughs> <laughs> What's with that? You have to look up in that one five. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, occasionally, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I've got about, around about a dozen people uh, who read for me. Uh, beta readers, I mean, everybody's like, can I do it? It's like, no, no you, you think I, I, it's bad <laughs> cliffhanging you a book at a time. I, I do this to that people chapter by chapter. You know, I'll, I'll get to the end of a chapter where you get to, uh, just a regular reader, you get to turn the page. When you're a beta reader, it's like, when's the next chapter going to be here? When are we going to find out when this ha what happens? <laughs> Couple weeks, maybe. I, I don't know. You know, whenever, whenever the muse strikes me. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're if you're interested in doing it, uh, uh, actually, there's a contact address on my on my website. Uh, there's kind of a waiting list, but if you if you're interested in in it, you know, get in contact. That'll go to my assistant, and she's keeping a list of people. So excellent, uh, Jimmy. You are showing up again here today. Is that right? I think so. What there's time? a schedule, but it's up in my room. Yeah, um, uh, I've got something it's from two to three. Two to three, I think it is. I've got it right to you. All right, so come back here two to three for more Jim Butcher. Uh, Jerry Schneiderman, thank you so much for helping me out with the questions. And uh, Jim Butcher, people, thank you. Thank you.